It, it's funny. So thinking, listening to the stream of stuff you were just talking about, I'm thinking about the tension between, um, between optimization, you know, getting something really dialed down like the copier machine or, you know, you, when I think of the alien dreadnought, I think of like, if you've ever cracked up one of those old mechanical calculators and it's just like wall to wall gears, just less like no space or like a, you know, a mechanical watch, you open that thing up and the guys have really optimized everything down. Now, of course, if you want to make a change to a mechanical watch, or if you want to make a change in one of those mm -hmm. calculators, like once you've got it built, your optimization is kind of working against you at that point, right? Because the more tightly you pack stuff together, the more the ripple effects of making any one change do, right? And, and when you look at factories today, like flying to that gear factory, like most of what you see is empty space, like all that space up to the ceiling, like there's nothing there. So the idea of like making best possible use and filling all that with machinery, like that's cool. That's a kind of optimization, right? But, uh, but it's, you know, like it's going to work against you to some extent if you have a dynamic environment. Like we want to be able to make changes on the fly to the cars or we want people to be able to go in and debug or we want to be able to modify one line, shut it down, you know, operate everything on a second line or move everything to the left so we can introduce it. Like a lot of that stuff you lose when you, so one of the reasons factories are so freaking big is because people are just like, oh, we think it takes this much space. Let's just build a giant building. And we'll figure it out as we go. It gives you a lot of flexibility because you've got all this space to move stuff around. Um, but yeah, it does. It, it costs money. So once AI starts coming into it, the thing AI gets you is it gets you generality. Like you, it, the machines themselves become much more on the fly kind of stuff and maybe even adaptable. Like right now, a human being, human beings aren't working on assembly lines. They're pretty general. You show them approximately what to do and they may mimic that. But as they get better at the job, they constantly refine and they can on the fly ad lib. Oh, we're out of this part. I'll work on that for a couple of minutes. And then when the bin comes over, then you catch up like you can, they can constantly rearrange the order that they're doing stuff in um, because they're general, right? So, so in a sense, one of the things that AI gets you is it gets you like all the robots st start to be able to do that, right? You like on some level, you get to do your optimization on the fly. You know, it, you can imagine at some end, you've got this really arbitrary alien dreadnought and like, oh, today we're going to make iPhones and tomorrow we're going to make <laughs> calculators and, you know, so that it, it's completely dynamic. So th I think these, th these two things are kind of intention, right? Like you can get super, super optimized at building one thing that you've thought through and you've spent a lot of time on it and you've really tuned it up but then you lose flexibility. So, you know, the other kind of optimal thing is like the anything factory, right? Where uh, like you can do anything with it. It can reconfigure on the fly. It's super dynamic. It can make several products, you know, alternately as it goes, you can change the feed stocks and it can adapt. And like, so that's another kind of vision of optimization. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's where the term flexible automation comes in because you have the hard automation where you really are making one product, but you're making it really well and you're making it really fast. So, you know, the classic example is, is a bottling factory. I mean, it's, it's hard automation and it does that and it's just kicking them out in the millions. The automotive factory, because your, your volumes aren't that high, you, want to, you need to have a little bit of flexibility to be able to program it. And many reasons that the robots are used the way they are is not because there's so much programmable but they're flexible. Oh, I can use the same piece of equipment to do this thing and that thing and that thing and that thing. So they're really using it that way. But the, the, the irony is that the whole idea of, of the robots is like, oh, they're flexible. We can reprogram them real easily. And it's like, well, maybe we can reprogram them, but sometimes it's not as easy as you think it would be. So a lot of time is spent in getting the robots to be programmed together. And then as you see, as they start working closely together, you have to start coordinating that stuff and it gets really tough. And then you've got to make sure that you, everyone accomplishes their task in a set amount of time. And if not, you know, people are sweating bullets out there trying to figure out what I do to make that move a little bit faster. And then they suddenly say, I can't hit all the welds. Can some other station take up this weld right now? So you might move those things around. And then getting the density in there, again, the robots themselves, because the way they're designed, they're designed as a six axis arm, because that's the minimum number of joints that you need to be able to reach all positions and orientation space. It doesn't mean you can't have more. And, and the reason why you put more in there is now you get redundancy that, that your elbow, rather than always having to be in one position, you can start moving around a little bit. So they want to come up with these robot arms that have a little bit more of that flexibility so they can really work next to each other. And I had seen one of those, those videos that, you know, Toyota is working on these arms that start to look more like a snake than a traditional robot arm because they might have like a double mm -hmm. elbow. And rather than orthogonal joints, they kind of are at 60 degrees to, to each other the way they roll around. And when they put them all together, 
if you look at it a little bit blurry, you'd think you're looking at like a dirt pile with earthworms in there that are just kind of like moving around all of a sudden. And it's just all, all of a sudden you get this chill down your spine. That's the alien dreadnought. I mean, it's going to be one of those things you're going to go in. And it's really going to look like something out of alien that you're going to be freaked out by what you're seeing because now the mechanisms are really honed. And it's that balance between how do we make sure it can be flexible enough to do something different. And literally, I mean, they have to be flexible to be able to get in. It's not just a question of can they reach the point, but can they access the point? So a lot of times it's like, yep, it's all in the robot workspace. Okay, can you get there? Oh, no, we can't. The part's too big or this is in the way and the fixture and you have to uh, change everything. And so there's this constant coordination and optimization. And if you can get an easier way to optimize it where the AI will come in and figure that out, that will make it a lot better. And especially if you can do, this is what I'd love to see happen, is when we are able to train optimists by showing optimists what to do, I wish we could do the same thing with the IR robots. There's no reason why the IR mm -hmm. robots cannot then use that programming paradigm. Because today, if I have a, a piece that needs to be welded, I can throw it down on a table. And if I have an expert welder and I can come over and just, you know, weld this part, and he'll examine it and then know exactly what has to be done. Now, he might consult a couple of engineering drawings here to confirm the type of weld you might there, but he's probably already got the instincts to know whether that's supposed to be a stitch weld, you know, whether it's a quarter inch fillet or an eighth inch fillet, whatever it is they have to do. He'll probably know, and if not, he'll know what, what resource to check. Right now, you throw that thing down in front of an industrial robot, and it just sits there and doesn't do anything. <laughs> so a guy's going to go over, and he's going to get this thing, this, what we call a teach pendant with a joystick, and lead the thing over, by, lead by teach, get in there, eyeball it. Yeah, that point looks good. Store. And then he's going to drag it along over there, uh, store that point. Replay it. Does it look like it's moving right? Oh, that's not quite right. And then he goes in, and there's a bunch of tests, and the quality of the well is not so good. And what do I have to do with the well parameters? It's very, very tedious going through that again and again and again. I just want to throw the part down and say, all right, you know what to do, right? I don't even have to explain it. Maybe the first time I show off them, say, hey, come over here. This is what welding is like. Yeah, you want to do a little bit of a drag at a 15 degree angle because it gives you the best quality. When you come in here, you're going to just have to rake it a little bit to make sure it comes in. Eventually, it'll understand that. But we can't do that. So today, when you look at those robots that are there, you're seeing a lot of metal. And you must think, wow, that's really costly. It's like, yeah, those robots are costly. But the tooling on the end of those things actually cost more than the arms themselves. And then all the safety fencing you put around there probably also costs as much as the robots themselves. They get all that stuff in there. Then you got the guys you get to hire to come in and program those things. They might also be 25 to 50% of the budget for that cell. Just the cost of someone going in and programming it and coordinating it and making sure it all, all gets together and fits together. So there's lots of room for improvement in the efficiency and the time it takes you to set up the process to get it going. And then there's the other of compressing it. And there has been a lot of effort. GM over the years, you know, I remember back in the 80s, they came up with this thing called RoboGuide. I think it was in combination with Kamau, where's the idea of baking this gate that you could put the robots in and hang them upside down so they could fit in. So rather than just having four robots, suddenly we were looking at, oh, we might be able to have six or eight robots being able to go in there and do a process. And that was already trying to compactify everything. But you can see we can compactify a lot more. If we get to you know, 24, 32 robots in one cell, that's going to be pretty impressive.